Would you like to impact a billion lives? Welcome to our show, IIT 2020, where we invite amazing speakers, thought leaders, futurists. Today, I have invited a very special guest, Mohit Aaron. He is co-founder of Cohesity, Nutanix. He holds undergrad from IIT Delhi, and that is his claim to fame, actually. What hostel were you, uh, Mohit? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry? What was, was your hostel? Oh, what was my hostel? Uh, it was Nilgiri, Nilgiri Neil. Hostel. Um, so go no. Nilgiri. I think you say go to exactly Neil Neil Bast. That's the program. All right, all right. We are, we are recognized. We are recognized first by our hostels, Absolutely. then by our IIT, and then by anything else. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm asking. Which hostel? Yeah, Neil Giri. It was Neil Giri. So I'm pretty sure. So how many unicorns our... are from Neil Giri? Oh my God. Uh, well, first of all, we had our 25th anniversary. Um, you know, uh, last year just before the pandemic, so we were lucky. I'm glad it wasn't this year. If it was this year, we wouldn't have been able to go back. Uh, but definitely um, a few have come out. Uh, so uh, Yashish Dahia, I think he's uh, into this uh, um, company on insurances and stuff. Policy like Bazaar. Getting the Policy Bazaar, uh, uh, he's one of them. Then Samir Gaylot, you know, behind- Oh, Samir Gaylot. is also here. Uh, great. Yeah, he's, he was my batchmate, actually. Uh, and then Yashish Dahiya was one year senior to me. And from Yashish's batch, there was uh, a few guys who also, uh, yeah, there was a Rajiv Ratan, who also was the co-founder of India Bulls. Uh, oh, nice. I'm sure there are others, uh, you know, but, uh, but these ones are in the neighboring areas. And then, um, actually, I don't even know the hostels of uh, some of the guys that have been unicorns and stuff, so I, I won't comment on that. But these are definitely uh, unicorns that Nilgiri produced. All right, I'm sure Nilgiri Janta will be very happy. So that's cool. <laughs> so, Mohit, let's talk about something really interesting and in which you and me have lived. We both started our life uh, when the internet was not really internet. It was just something there where you can transfer the data. And today, internet has transformed the world. It is, has made remotest part of the earth accessible. We are all connected beyond our imagination. I mean, 20 years ago, I don't believe either of us could even think of having this conversation, what we are having right now. 20 years ago, in spite of all the challenges of COVID, if you and me see it, the world is still functional. Healthcare system is still able to provide. Uh, financial systems are still up. People are getting food. We have electricity to all the other utilities in our homes. If I'm not mistaken, we can give a lot of credit to technology, especially internet. Am I right? You're absolutely right. I think the last uh, 25 or so years has been just phenomenal growth in our connectivity and the internet. I still remember when uh, when I was uh, in IIT, which was the years 91 to 95, we had the intranet, <laughs> but the internet was not quite available. It was not that prevalent. Uh, the chosen few had it, uh, but for the most part, uh, the common person, the common man did not have internet. Um, and even us uh, as students, uh, we had internal email accounts, so we could send emails to people within IDs, but we did not have permission uh, to send emails outside. I think at the time, only the faculty and senior people in ID used to have that permission. But I think uh, that opened up. I think there was a whole, um, you know, just almost a revolt, if you may. <laughs> Suddenly the internet came in with a big bang and um, who doesn't know the internet boom? I think the, by the late nineties, everyone, uh, even I remember the time when my parents asked me, so what is this internet thing? Can you teach us how to do email? <laughs> so I just remember those fun conversations. Uh, 
and then i think internet became a part of life i think we can't even think uh, these days if uh, if we now forget our smartphones um, somewhere we feel incomplete <laughs> but that was something very foreign right we never grew up in a world where we uh, carried the internet in our pocket um, and 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 these days it's unthinkable to uh, go anywhere uh, without the internet uh, you know if i have a power cut in my house and it happens even even now you know uh, whether it's a heat wave or something in california uh, and i'm without internet uh, i actually go towards my phone okay at least my phone has an internet <laughs> so it's just crazy um so so yeah absolutely things have really changed and we are really connected i remember back in those times i mean the, how often did we used to talk to our relatives only the close ones mm-hmm. but now i'm i'm connected to friends who you know were my classmates in 6th grade or 7th grade and you know we you know like hey remember me <laughs> that was never possible earlier so so great stuff yeah i don't know about that how far you want to go because there are a lot of lot of skeletons in the closet but uh, let's just stay here there are skeletons in the closet <laughs> there are some people that we pretend that we don't know you <laughs> exactly exactly and they know us very differently so they have hard time in even relating to us today because the world you and me live in has changed but for some people it yeah, I, i worry that they'll start calling me with those names they used to call me <laughs> so the question uh, mohit is where are we going as you know the theme uh, for our conference is future is now the future is now and what we are really trying to understand or at least start a dialogue that future is not 50 years if we don't act upon it today we will not be able to handle the future we will not be able to take care of the 3 billion more people going to be our uh, resident or global citizens yes. so what is your take on that um you know at any given point in time there is so much going on so let's try to capture a few things so clearly uh, ai is the rage machine learning ai you know uh, with the advent of uh, you know google self driving cars there was a lot of interest in ai and you know um, you know a lot of companies these days uh, get funded with uh ai as the supporting technology but also a lot of companies that i know are not doing anything about ai they just want to insert ai somehow in their in what they're doing just to look cool so all that stuff is of course going on but uh one thing that i love to work on personally is uh, is data i mean data is sort of the new oil and um uh, you know with the advent of the internet as network speeds have become faster as disk speeds have become faster as disk capacities have grown as distributed systems technologies have grown as cloud has grown i think data is just exploded i can't even tell you how many zettabytes of data are, are getting produced every year and and it is true it is the new oil uh, you know much more important now than the oil of yester years uh, organizations live and breathe these days um, through their data anyone who's uh, going to be behind on their data they are worried that their competition will surpass them uh, because of the insights that you know the com- the competitor might draw out of that data and so data management is one aspect that has become really important how do you manage such a large um, scale of data because uh, you know we started the internet from a place where uh, yes there was connectivity but there was also a lot of silos so we we have a lot of silos storing the data and all these silos are connected using the internet but there are silos and when we need to process the data when we need to manage the data we have to take the data from one silo copy it out to another silo and then manage it um, and then maybe run some compute on it and this has become very expensive and hard so now we are uh, you know the next generation of infrastructure is looking to kind of consolidate these silos build platforms you know that this is where um, some of the hyperscalers have made a big mark uh, especially for consumer data right the googles and what not what not the googles the facebooks and some of that technology is now coming to the enterprise world Uh, my own company kohizri has been uh, at the forefront of that 
you know, bringing data management for enterprises into the world, getting rid of, rid of some of those silos. So that's one direction that's very interesting. And then what to do with that data? So rather than letting it sit in silos, let's bring it to one platform. But then now that it's on platform, how do you manage it? What value can you extract from it? You know, in the earlier days, it was, like I said, easier to move around the data. There wasn't that much. Um, but these days, data is actually growing faster than our networking speeds. Sure. So it's actually very hard to move around data or copy it around and then do something with it. So now the the direction in which we are headed is that try to keep data in one place as much as possible and then move compute to it. So there are platforms being built that consolidate the data, yes, but uh, then they also allow compute to be run in place or to get uh, insights or what have you from that data. I mean, there are all sorts of things, right? There's people want to um, get insights from the data. Maybe they want to uh, get insights for GDPR purposes. Maybe they want to process some um, uh, classified information. Maybe they want to detect uh, stuff for ransomware, uh, you know, malware. Ransomware, by the way, is on the rise. So, uh, you know, it's not <laughs> just us that have realized that data is important. It's also the hackers around the world. And they literally uh, would break into, uh, you know, very sophisticated algorithms for breaking into companies and, and then holding their data to ransom. You know, in my time, you know, in our time when we were growing up, uh, you know, if you want to make some money the illegal way, you'd probably like to kidnap someone <laughs> and, and ask for ransom. These days, you kidnap their data. You don't kidnap a person. You kidnap their data and then ask for ransom. Right? <laughs> so, so that's on the rise. Uh, you know, a lot of companies that, you know, we I have a, some of the I can give you a real companies. story on that, Mohit. Uh, last year, yeah. one of my friends runs a very large uh, construction company in uh, Vegas several billion dollar revenues. Uh, so somebody uh, uh, hacked into their system. Uh, for three days, they couldn't function. Yeah. And they end up paying in Bitcoin for real. Nobody could help them. And I was thinking in my head at that time is just uh, how far we have taken this uh, let's call it liberty or call it, uh, I don't know what to even call it uh, because it is more than even killing someone. In my opinion, the people are keeping organization hostage. And if we really look at it today, uh, the wars, if, even if we talk about this, we don't need bombs. We don't need to nuke countries. You can just bring uh, one of the stock market down and the country will be on its knees. So That's right. there are a lot of fundamental yeah. challenges and issues. But before we jump, and, and, I have a question for you. Yes, go ahead. Here looks very interesting what you have. So what is in the back, that yellow thing? Oh, um, you mean my, my chair, this one? Yeah. It's, it's orange. Oh. It's actually a gaming chair. Ah. And, uh, you know, the fun stuff is that uh, you can actually buy them very uh, cheaply off of Amazon. And they look pretty professional. And they give you, you know, exact a feeling. <laughs> so ah, okay. I strongly encourage people to go go buy their, their chairs for their home offices from Amazon. Uh, look for a gaming chair. So this is actually a gaming chair. And so, so yes. Are you a gamer uh, too? Or you play some games? I, I used to be a gamer. I'm no longer a gamer, but I like now having gaming chairs for my home desktop, from, from, my, from my home office. Nice. Uh, my, my, my son has a regular chair and I have a gaming oh, chair. Oh, really? <laughs> He's a gamer. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right that's so cool Any, anyhow i think we were talking about ransomware by the way you're right you don't have to directly kill or threaten to kill anyone you know uh, i think in our area ucsf um, you know which is an excellent uh, university but also a hospital that got attacked by ransomware it was on the news oh. uh, and i think they had i believe they had to pay up because uh, you know if they held a uh, patient data at hostage. I mean, there are lives at risk here. So, and I think last year, I believe Honda was attacked. Uh, or was it this year? I, I don't remember. So this is like really significant companies who are, who have significant, uh, least sophisticated systems that are being attacked. And so it's a real problem. So data again is the new oil. Um, it's the lifeblood of a company these days. And the hackers know 
let's attack that because then they can milk some money out. So that's uh, very, very interesting. There's a whole lot of other research going on with data, right? I mean, uh, look, uh, we now hear about this vaccines for, uh, for the pandemic that's going on. I mean, uh, typically a vaccine used to take 10 years to, to, to bring out. But look at where we are. I mean, uh, in less than a year, we have, you know, uh, the world out there has rolled out a vaccine. And that's all because of all the data and information exchange that is going on between all the, uh, all the medical facilities that are uh, trying to build a vaccine. Uh, you know, literally, when the, vac when the pandemic was, uh, it, it started um, becoming a problem, the Chinese guys uh, rolled out its genome, the sequences genome, and using that, the uh, companies in other parts of the world started building a vaccine. And that sort of stuff was unheard of. I mean, imagine, uh, you know, the, the diseases of the old days, how many decades it took before, like, uh, medicine came out. I mean, polio, for instance, right, it was a huge problem for decades, uh, tuberculosis, polio. Um, and now we have this pandemic, and within, like, 10 months, we have a very promising number of candidates. That's all possible because of the internet because of the uh, processing power we have because of the data uh, that we can exchange the amounts of data that we can store them I in a typical genome sequences like you know uh, multiple multiple gigabytes just one sequence and uh, and they probably have to experiment with with multiple ones so it's just fascinating what we can do with data these days so so that's definitely one direction ai is definitely another direction you know machine learning like i said and some of this, of course, interacts with each other, right? Uh, you, you do machine learning on the data. Um, so lots of fascinating stuff that is going on. Um, so I think you said, where is the world going towards? I think the world of tomorrow is definitely going to be a data world. It's definitely going to be a, a AI slash machine learning world. But I also want to caution people that uh, they shouldn't get over-focused on any one discipline. Um, I think AI and machine learning are great, but it shouldn't be that everyone is now thinking about data and machine learning. There's also other innovations to be had um, in every aspect of software. So I have one right? question, Mohit, before we jump to that on data. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. So one is, I'm not sure if you're aware, uh, there's a company out of uh, London, uh, one of the IIT Dali alum, uh, Sumit Jamwar, he has the largest uh, set of genome data for Asian population. Uh, very interesting conversations I had with him around the data. The question I have is, the data we have today, it's in silos all over the world. Uh, when we talk about even vaccine, we talk about uh, at global level of problem, still the data is not being made available as a service because there is uh, that fundamental layer or understanding, I'm not an expert of that, but I, personally believe if someone can come up with the concept that every single hospital globally can share data and that this data uh, will be still private, can be managed, cannot be used to reverse engineer, do create uh, maybe the new virus, I don't know. But how far are we from that? And is there anybody working on creating that layer? Because you have an extensive experience. You have seen zettabytes and zettabytes of data. Where are we heading when we talk about this kind of fabric? Yeah, so actually, uh, you know, you'd be surprised. We are actually headed in that direction faster uh, than people realize. Uh, you know, all the big cloud companies are, in essence, building data lakes, um, you know, where people can house that data, irrespective of whether you're in London or in California or what have you. Uh, my own company, Kuhizari, is trying to do something similar for enterprise data. Um, you know, so we're actually heading very fast in that direction. And, and people have realized that the world of tomorrow is not a siloed world. Um, the world of tomorrow is a world where everything is accessible, but you need to make it accessible uh, in the right way. So it's protected. You can't steal it. Uh, and also what people are realizing is that... Um, the ability to access and maybe run some computations on that is, is a privilege in itself. So you can afford that as a service. So, so not only should you be able to expose your data in a safe way, uh, you should also be able to um, you know, allow third-party services or compute 
to, or, or apps, if you may, to be run on that data. And, and when the data is running in exabytes and petabytes, and imagine the foolishness of trying to take the data in London, which might be in zettabytes and trying to copy it to California or New York or what have you. Why not take the compute? And that's where you know, we are coming up with concepts, very modularized concepts like containers mm -hmm. uh, that people can wrap their computation in containers um, and then send those containers close to where the data sits and run it there. And the person who owns the data can perhaps charge for that service, right? Oh. So we're actually moving very fast in that direction. Um, and I think uh, technology really moves fast, give it another four or five years and you'll see a whole lot of that stuff happening. Uh, already, I think a lot of our customers are really, like I'm talking about big customers, big banks, they're seriously looking into much more modularized way of running computations on their data, as opposed to the legacy where, where it was all siloed and there was like these monolithic servers that were in charge of running those computations. They're trying to modularize it, put the apps and you know compute inside containers and just ship those containers wherever the data sets, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's in a data center, whether it's in London, whether it's in New York. Uh, and so you'll see that happening. We're moving in that direction for sure. That's fascinating. I mean, you know, I was asking this question from uh, one very senior VC. And uh, the question I was asking is, when we talk about mobile app, as a mobile app developer, I'm just oversimplifying the problem, but uh, most of the mobile app developers have no freaking clue how the backend works. There is like API for every single thing. You just plug it and you create your app and you are in Heroku to uh, uh, Google to everybody has so many APIs. I haven't seen that infrastructure for enterprises yet. I haven't seen the infrastructure exactly what you're talking about where I don't care about the data. What I care about is the meaning with the data or analytics with the data or the results with the data, or I want to use it to do something. So you are saying is it's already happening. It is happening. I think uh, uh, we, we saw the power of what a small smartphone can do for us, right? What you were mentioning, people saw, oh my God, I can actually have a marketplace on my smartphone. And by the way, I can have like a, a team that has no idea about backend infrastructure actually build an app that's quite powerful just by giving them an API and giving them an SDK to help build that app. Why don't we do this for enterprise data or for consumer data sitting on the, on the cloud? Uh, and so a lot of that stuff is actually happening. And that's where I said, I think give it a couple of years and you'll see a lot of that. Already uh, the Amazons of the world, the Googles of the world, they're rolling out, you know, uh, services and props. I mean, you can, Amazon has a marketplace, you can put apps on that, uh, and, and those apps can work on the data that you store on Amazon. Uh, many companies are embracing that concept. Um, you know, Salesforce has the notion of a marketplace. Uh, my company, Kuhizri, has a notion of a marketplace. So the, the stuff that we kind of have tried and tested in like a smartphone are now, um, you know, being embraced by, by huge organizations out there and how they deal with their data, absolutely. I forgot the name of the guy, Steve Jobs, uh, Andy something. I don't know, you may know him. Uh, the person who uh, gave uh, Steve Jobs idea of App Store. And for one year, Steve Jobs registered that idea. And the next year, they launched it after the launch of iPhone. I forgot the name, uh, Bill something. Anyway, I just uh, listened to that audio book. I'll send you the name. So very interesting concept we both know. And that is my next question. So it is proved that in the consumer world, you can make a lot of money with microtransactions. You sell your app for a buck, 10 cents, 1 cent, 2 cents, 3 cents, and all of that. There is nothing like that in the enterprise space. So let's talk a little bit about the pricing models because you and me saw that uh, in the early 90s, Oracle world, we used to go and deploy these boxes and charge millions and millions of dollars. Then we came up with the license based on client, all of that. Then we got to the Salesforce model where you have per user model. Where are we heading with that for enterprise specifically? Yeah, first let's realize, I think it's, uh, the consumer market is very different from the enterprise market in the sense that you know, we have like 7 billion people in the world. 
uh, or thereabouts. And, uh, uh, you know, any consumer company can make money through volume. What that means is that they can have billions of people using the product and they can charge a few cents. So, so whole different kinds of uh, micro transactions become possible because of that. And that's why you see that on, a, on my smartphone, most apps are like, uh, you know, a few dollars. And that's good enough because if uh, an app builder can actually charge like a few bucks uh, from me, but they uh, sell that app to like a million people, I mean, they're in good shape, right, per year. But that unfortunately does not work for enterprise because we don't have billions of um, enterprise companies. And so uh, that automatically um, boxes enterprise uh, developers into building products from uh, for, for which they can charge slightly more. So they'll have fewer customers, but per customer they will charge more. Now, like you, you said, uh, we started in a world where the oracles of the world were charging millions. But that was for uh, perhaps a perpetual license, right? So they'll sell the product to you once, and now it's for it, it, you own it forever, uh, unless. It was a perception, boy. You, you and me both know that because every three it's years. A they <laughs> but but they are able to charge, or that's that's their justification. Uh, but now you know we we look at we embrace some of the uh, cloud technologies and we uh, use some of the SaaS products, and we're like, hmm. The subscription thing is actually useful. I don't have to, I, I'm not really interested in Oracle. I'm really interested in using Oracle. Let Oracle manage itself uh, and I'll pay for the use, right? And, and so now uh, there is a whole lot of that shift towards subscription. And it also helps, you know, enterprise companies uh, from a predictability point of view. Because uh, when you're selling perpetual licenses, uh, every quarter is like a new quarter where you start from zero. But if it's subscription, I mean, as long as you can keep your customer happy, you know that every quarter there is going to be some subscription renewals coming up. And so it builds like, let's say you want to make hundred million, uh, you, the, the Wall Street expects you to make hundred million dollars in that quarter. Mm -hmm. And if out of that hundred million dollars, you already made 40 or 50 because of your subscription revenue, because of any renewals that you had to do. Well, now you have to make much less, so it becomes way more predictable. Sure. Uh, and so, even enterprise companies like that model. And these days, um, that's the first push we are seeing. Uh, you know, people are embracing. Mm -hmm. You know, they're 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 going away from perpetual models and going more towards subscription models. The second shift we are seeing is that uh, people are going away from um, from ownership. I, even the subscription part, they they want that. Okay, I don't want to own this you guys own it or have like a third party own it and, and run it as a service. Um, and, and I'll just pay, you know, subscription for that. And then even a further uh, uh, move in that direction is I'll only pay for consumption. I won't pay for uh, like a one year license or what have you, I'll pay for what I use it for, right? So there's a whole lot, a whole lot of these new, very fascinating models that have, that have emerged as, as, uh, as a result of, uh, the new age SaaS and 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 whatnot business models, and we are seeing quite a bit of that, and and customers actually like it. I mean, it's uh, you know it's owning a car versus doing Uber. Uber is all about you know consumption, right? I'll pay for exactly what I use. Uh, I won't pay otherwise. The car is owned by someone else. He he or she takes care of the car. I only pay you know whatever 20, 30 bucks uh, the time when I use it. But if I own a car now, I have to worry about everything. Now, in some cases, uh, owning a car does make sense, uh, but in some cases, it does not, right? If I'm here living at home uh, and I frequently use my car, maybe it makes sense to own the car. But if I'm frequently traveling, I'm going to Chicago, I'm going to New York, I'm going to London. I don't want to own a car in Chicago and a car in London. <laughs> you know, it's much easier to just pay for what I use. Uh, and so I think the world of tomorrow is uh, probably a hybrid world. There's no one um, direction. It's not like one thing is a superset of the other. There's going to be room for everything. Uh, but we are emerging from a world where we only had one choice. And we are going towards a world where we now have multiple choices. You know, we can own something. We can pay for perpetual stuff. We can do just subscription. We can pay for just consumption. So there are whole of these um, options now available. So I guess your question was, where are we going? We are going towards 
a very hybrid world where we're going to have multiple options to choose from. That's where we're going. That would be interesting. I mean, uh, we both know uh, one size doesn't fit all. Even in app stores, there are apps which is a buck to and as much as you want to pay, depending upon the value it delivers. Uh, I completely uh, understand and from where you are coming is uh, there may be a future where uh, a uh, company like Cohesity will start taking a piece of revenues. This is, okay, guys, you know what? I'll just take a piece of action. This is the problem we are solving. I'll take a point, half a point, basis point, whatever, right? And that's where I see my head is if I'm a business, I will say, you know what? Uh, Cohesity provide me this much service. I'm willing to give 10 basis point or 15 basis point of my revenues. So that way I have predictable expense and they run it. They know their business better than me and they will be responsible to it's almost like credit card transaction. But That's right. I mean, look, we live in an ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, no one company, you know, even the famous companies, Google's, Apple's, Facebook's of the world, they are an ecosystem. Yes, they have built something phenomenal, which they charge for. Um, but then other people who built on that platform um, charge for whatever they built, but give a cut to these guys. And so uh, absolutely, I think we're moving to that world where, Successful companies are really going to be an ecosystem. They charge for some, but they let others work with them, uh, and then they all do some profit sharing and, and revenue sharing. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, we uh, in uh, the company I was running earlier, uh, we uh, worked out a deal with the Salesforce. Unfortunately, we had some interesting issues with uh, some other call, but uh, they said we will take uh, twenty percent of your revenues. You price whatever you want to price. These are our key requirement. We build the whole thing and we sign up a major brand as a customer. And then we had some uh, internal legal issues with them. Otherwise, uh, we were ready to go. So I do agree with you on that. But my question is really philosophically a little different when we talk about data. And we talked about data in silos. And you are an expert of data. I mean, you have done PhD in data for real. And uh, you understand data inside out. Uh, you are a uh, co-founder of Nutanix too. So you have seen the growth of data. My question is still I'm going back to is, now you have a consumer data, which is, uh, can be in the hospitals. Then we have a data of uh, our data in institutions, which is IITs of the world or Stanford's of the world. Then we have some data about demographic data, which is government control. So if we really look at essentially there are three key stakeholders who have our data. Government, private institution or organizations like you or anybody else or uh, those companies, whether financial, health and all. And the third one is I can call it institution. So these are the three different key parties have our data or the world's data in different silos. Reality is we need all of them to participate and create some kind of partnership. So at, at, for a greater good, like for example, right now, we are working on solving this vaccine problem. Uh, people are saying 95% success, 96% success. I don't know what that means. Does that mean five people will die if they take the vaccine or if it is only 95% people, it will be effective and 5% will be still prone? And how it is going to impact because the amount of data we have is not enough. Right? Is it going to work on Indian? Is it going to work on American? Is it going to work on Asian? What is really the data? And we don't have enough of that, we both know. So we need to find better system to aggregate the data. We need to create a better infrastructure for that. So nobody like hackers or ransom guy, they don't take this data and put some other data in it because problem is not just they block. Now I see bigger problem. Bigger problem is they start putting the data which is inaccurate. So now you and me are struggling. We are taking decisions based on this false data. So the complexity has gone up. So what do you think about that? What I'm pretty sure it keeps you up in the night too, these problems. All right, uh, that, there's a lot of questions there. So first of all, I would say that, uh, yes, I've been working with data for a while, but I don't think anyone in the world can claim they know data inside out. I mean, data is just like, there's just so much uh, information and expertise you can build on data. Uh, it's, uh, you know, in one lifetime, it's probably not, in, not enough for anyone to be able to know data inside out. Uh, so with that, I'll give you my humble opinion. So look, in my opinion, um, you know, huge distributed systems are built in layers. 
Uh, today, what's happening is that, like you said, I mean, there are these three institutions. There's a government, there's a private institution, there's, uh, uh, you know, maybe there's the public cloud or whatever. Uh, and they're all keeping the data in silos like you observe. And this is similar to what used to happen maybe in a data center earlier where there was one appliance, uh, you know, and then there was a second one and a third one and they all kept the data differently. So now going back to my statement that, you know, distributed systems are built in layers. What it means is that let these be the lowest, lowermost layer. How about we build a level of abstraction on top that logically looks like one platform, but it kind of spreads itself across these lower layers, right? So in essence, I mean, to draw an analogy, that's what these hyperscalers have done. And when you do a search in Google, you really don't know whether that result is coming from Australia or whether it's coming from New York. When Google has tons of these data centers around the world, what they have built is they'll build a level of abstraction on top, right? To make, to kind of sew all them together, even though the physical servers are sitting separately, there is this level of abstraction that's making it look like one platform. So, so the first thing that's needed is a level of abstraction that sews all this together. So that's the second layer. Then you need a layer where now that it's a logical abstraction, now you can inject compute on it, in it, uh, and start doing something with that data. Uh, and, and extract insights. And by the way, that compute has to be smart enough that if some data has been um, infected uh, and it needs to be able to flag it, right? It needs to be able to figure out that this doesn't statistically look right or you know, these are all machine learning concepts and what have you, you can, uh, you, you can figure out statistically whether this data is compliant with that all other data that you're seeing. And so you can discard this data. So you can now see how things are going to be built in the future in layers. There's absolutely the lowermost layer, which is what people are basically doing today. They're just storing all the data in the lowermost layer and trying to do computations there, which is why they end up in silos. What we think, what I think is needed is a level of abstraction, just like the hyperscalers like AWS and Google and whatnot have built just for themselves. We need an abstraction that sits on top. Uh, you know, my company, Kuhizri, also believes in that. We are building one of those, those abstractions. Yeah. Now that you have this abstraction that removes all these silos, now you can maybe provide a marketplace on top to work on that platform. And so that's, I think, the future of tomorrow, where things are going to be laid in abstractions and everyone can just plug in their abstraction and use the other layers that are available and everything becomes a service. Uh, everything has a contract. Um, a certain layer gives you an abstraction. It hides all the details underneath that and gives you a contract. Okay, if you talk to me through an API, this is what I give you. And then you go to the layer above, this is what I give you, right? If you look at uh, some of the companies that went uh, IPO recently, Snowflake, uh, in essence, they've built an abstraction for data warehousing that sets above the clouds. They hide the underlying details of the clouds and they give an abstraction. Okay, if you talk to the Snowflake API, uh, it gives you a data warehousing abstraction. Right, uh, they'll give you transactions or what have you. Um, and now you're not really aware that whether the data is coming from one geography or the, or a different geography, you just look at it as a data warehouse. And now you can build further layers on top of that data warehouse, right? So you can see this um, concept uh, again and again. Even within Google, I was in Google for five years, um, is all bunch of abstractions, all layers. There's yep. one layer that handles the underlying storage. There's another layer that makes it all look like one platform. There's another layer that does something interesting on top. There's another layer uh, that now implements Gmail on top, <laughs> right? So it's all a layered architecture. Yeah. So do you see that uh, there will be a day where uh, these three stakeholders, key stakeholders who have our data uh, will partner and create some kind of standards for uh, our benefit, because as of now, it feels like everybody's working for their own benefit. And that's the biggest challenge. We talk about privacy to everything. Yeah, in my personal opinion, um, they probably will not. But what's going to happen is there's going to be a layer put on top. And then that layer be becomes the common piece. It hides these three guys. So even if these three guys are not interoperating with each other, that layer on top will. And so as long as you interact with that layer, you really don't care if these three don't work with each other. 
So that is an opportunity, an idea for all our uh, friends, actually, or audience. I think that's where the world is going. Absolutely. That's where the world is going. And, um, you know, that's the key to managing all these exabytes and zettabytes of, of, of data and doing something interesting with it. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I always like to map it to a smartphone. A smartphone is a platform um, which logically provides you with multiple services, like it provides you with a phone, it provides you with a GPS, a music player, and blah, blah, blah. But it, it is constructed in layers. You know, if you look at an iPhone, there is hardware, right? And then there is the iOS on top. And then each of these services that I talked about is built as an app. Yeah. And then you can even add more apps by downloading them from a marketplace. And so now this platform is so powerful that people can now build more and extend the power of that platform. Now imagine that for the data in the real world. Um, build a logical platform and everyone can you know, contribute and, and enhance the functionality of that. Uh, and the data is kind of available. And so that's a, a fascinating image that I uh, you know, think the world should go towards. No, Mohit, I uh, really, uh, I understand from where you are coming and it is my wish someday we will be able to get to the right thing, the right thing, sooner and faster. Uh, because I personally believe the data is in silos creating more challenges for humanity and it's creating more problems. And uh, on a serious note, if uh, uh, for this uh, summit we are going to do on December 4th and 5th, there are three key areas we are focusing. Global economy, health, and food. Now, when we talk about any of these areas, growth is only possible if the data is available. For example, when we talk about uh, food, food innovation, how do you create next generation of food? We can't feed 3 billion more people with the same way we are feeding 7.5 or 7.8 billion people today. There is no way, Earth cannot produce more. Uh, we are going to over fertilize our land or we are going to cut more forests and we have nothing, nothing left. Uh, we have huge sustainability issues. The same way when we talk about uh, uh, just health, I believe there are so many opportunities to improve basic things. However, the data is not available. Uh, we both know this pandemic is a wake-up call. In fact, when I saw initially, and I say, we have uh, systems to predict tsunami. We have systems to pick earthquake. Why not for pandemic? This data, if we can put a layer exactly the abstraction you are talking about, and it's made available, we can make our world safer. We may be able to cure a lot of major diseases if we have better understanding of things going on around the world. And even global economy, exactly what you and me were talking about it is, there are so many companies stock tank, there are so many companies stock keep going up. There are no fundamentals a lot of time, not always, but there are, so what is happening? And if people have better understanding of the data and company like yours, if you can maybe, this is a question for uh, you actually is, can you, Talk about three to four opportunities you think our uh, uh, alumni should work on. We have so many amazing, amazing people. I talk to so many uh, uh, graduates. I can't even tell you more. This generation, man, they are not like us. They are way smarter than us. It's scary. Seriously, it's scary. I think they can use some challenge. Absolutely. I, I think I would say uh, one challenge in this world where uh, data is so accessible is going to be security, right? Uh, think about how we do security today in the enterprise world. I mean, we just put like a firewall <laughs> around our data, around our systems, and boom, we think it's secure. But in this day and age, uh, where literally you have one weak link in that firewall, um, you're insecure. But now that the data is now literally accessible in the world, how do you now uh, do security? So security, uh, privacy, governance, compliance, um, they're all going to become really big problems. So that's one area that uh, I think our budding entrepreneurs should look at. Um, you know, imagine, I mean, I always say that if you are an entrepreneur, don't work on the problem that you see today. Work on a problem that is going to be a problem two years from today, because that's how long you're going to take to probably build a phenomenal product. 
so 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 by the time you build the product, it should become a real problem. And I think two years from today, I think what's going to become a real problem is uh, the data is accessible, but it's not secure. And so we need new ways to think about security. We need ways to ship computation in a secure way, right? And the computation I said earlier uh, can be shipped today, modulized, modularized, and put in containers. But who is to say that computation is only allowed to do stuff that uh, you know it has privileges to do that? What prevents it from you know doing nasty stuff? So think about all those things in terms of security. So for instance, if I allow some data to be exposed, I have lots of data on um, you know maybe the genome sequence for the pandemic, uh, and someone from a different continent pays me that hey I'll ship you some compute to run some compute in your data. Um, so I said, okay, uh, I'll, I'll let you do that. But what if your compute does something nasty and doesn't just do what it was supposed to do, but it starts accessing some other data or starts you know, breaking into other systems or what have you. So security becomes very important. Um, you, you know, Mobile security, and I don't mean uh, security on your smartphones. Yes, that's very important too. But mobile means that when you ship around computations, uh, the security associated with that. Uh, you know, how do you run your stuff safely? And and now this computation runs and it collects some information. How do you transmit that information securely back? Uh, so all that stuff is going to become really, really important. So so stuff for our budding new entrepreneurs to think about, uh, you know, how, how to address some of these problems, because these are going to be real problems uh, going forward. I think you're on mute. No, sorry. Uh, it seems like uh, in the post-pandemic world, and I'm calling it post-pandemic because uh, I firmly believe in the human grit and we will be out of the situation. Uh, there is silver lining. And that is we start thinking our earth as not disconnected. We started our earth as connected nodes. Now, we all started thinking like global citizens. We are not thinking like isolated person. Uh, you are from uh, Chandigarh, I am from Delhi, or Meerut, and all of that. We are all connected. And the COVID has united all of us, actually, whether we like it or not. But the reality is COVID has united all of us, which is an interesting problem. But uh, the biggest challenge I hear from you when we talk about data is uh, security. And uh, well, it's, when it's, you it's see, one of the big challenges. It's one of the big challenges. One of say it's challenges. the only challenge, but it's one of the big ones. Absolutely. Well, the other challenges you are solving anyway. So for audience, well, I'm, I'm solving security. some of the challenges. But there are, there's going to be plenty of challenges. Um, security is one of them. Compliance, data governance, um, building infrastructure, building apps, um, you, you know, moving around uh, computations in a secure way, uh, but security itself comes in multiple flavors. It's the security of the data, security of the computation, um, security against um, rogue uh, computations. Uh, it's uh, also how to monitor stuff, how to meter it. So you want to run some computations, well, how do you charge for that? How do you build those um, well, models to talk, I got it. Mm. charge back and stuff? So there's very interesting problems that are going to come up. Um, and then there's also uh, you know, resource utilization. How do you move around computation? So let's say uh, you, know, you run a huge server farm or you have a lot of data and you, are, you run a service um, and you say that, Mohit, send me your computation so I can do something interesting on the data. But then I send you that, uh, but it becomes a hotspot. How can you move around your computation and even your data so that those hotspots can be reduced, uh, kind of spread around the load? Um, so there's like lots and lots of, fascinating stuff that can uh, be, be, be built and researched upon. And, and I think very fascinating companies can be built around that. So in the layman's term, can I say that it's like uh, data is almost like now, it's like a human body. You got <laughs> hurt somewhere. Now their body has a mechanism to go and fix it by itself. And we have to invent those algorithms to go and find these either it's a hard spot or is a Trojan or whatever we call it, we got hurt and understand these um, molecular level, what is happening in the data structure and solve those problems or at least identify it. 
and I'll go a step beyond. Um, you know, we need to build artificial intelligence, so it's gonna fix us by itself. <laughs> Just like our body heals by itself, right? Um, so without us uh, consciously doing anything about it, for, for the most part. Sure. Um, and so how about we build um, AI algorithms uh, so that all that stuff happens automatically without human intervention, without us uh, thinking explicitly about it. Uh, so all that stuff is also gonna be very interesting. So I have a question on that, Mohit. Yeah. It seems like we are going to outsource, uh, we are going to outsource job of thinking to machines. What are we going to do? <laughs> well, for the foreseeable future, uh, the machines are our companions. I mean, think about laptops or computers, right? When they came, people are like, oh, this is gonna take away my job. Well, not really. They complimented you. Um, they made even more jobs possible. Yes, they took away some manual stuff, but they made more possible. Uh, but there will come a point, I think, what is it called? The singularity or, or something in, in fancy robotics terms, where the machines become actually more, more uh, intelligent than humans. And so now the humans are kind of not needed anymore. And everyone have, has their own philosophy about that. My, uh, my own take is that that's where we go on welfare, literally because the humans, the machines can do stuff better than humans at that point. So there is no point in letting a human do anything. Uh, the humans just become, uh, all of them go on welfare. So they, uh, you know, uh, have fun, they play games, they do whatever they want, but they don't really actually use their brain to do it. <laughs> I think we're, we'll probably come to that point, but I don't think that point is um, coming anytime soon. And now is that soon? 50 years, is that 100 years? I, I, it's hard to predict at this point. But, but we are headed towards a point where the machines will be smarter than humans. And when that happens, society will change, for sure. Yeah, it'll be, uh, it's a scary thought. Uh, and uh, who knows, it'll, uh, I don't believe it will happen in our lifetime. But yeah, it'll be interesting uh, to think about it. And we don't know, everything started, uh, if we look, at, look back at our life, I still remember when in India, we implemented uh, computers to make uh, reservations uh, for trains and uh, uh, banks, we thought everybody will be jobless and we created more opportunities, not just the jobs, we created more opportunities. We created a, in my opinion, a better word, but again, a lot of people may say well, we are overworked. All of us are working 16, 18, 20 hours nowadays instead of uh, eight hours, which was the norm. But uh, that's the conversation for some other day. So Mohit, I heard a lot of your interviews and you talk a lot about team building. You talk about entrepreneurship. I know we can spend hours on that. What do you think about that? And what is your thought for especially anybody who wants to start a new company, new startup, he has very limited budget or no money. What are the five yeah, things? I'll, 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 say, I'll say a few things in the 10 or so minutes that we've left. Um, uh, the first thing I would say, I'm, you know, I think our audience is a lot of ITNs and especially young ITNs. I, my message to them is that please don't be in a hurry to jump and become an entrepreneur. And I say that because um, any company has uh, only a few uh, big mistakes that it can make. Um, you know, every mistake that you make sets your company back, you know, six months, one year, whatever it is. And there's only so many you can make before the company then goes down. What, what we don't want to see is that uh, you get so burnt with that experience that you, you don't want to do another company ever again. And I've seen people like that. So my strong um, suggestion, advice uh, is to first join good companies learn what it takes to build one. Uh, and once you're sort of uh, confident that you've learned enough, then and only then jump, jump and do your own company, right? So that's the first advice I'll give you. The second one I would say is uh, a lot of ITNs, look, we're all high performers. We're all, you know, we, we ace the JEEs and I'm sure a bunch of people watching this, uh, they've done very well in their uh, exams and through the IDs and they uh, went for higher studies and, and whatnot. We tend to be a lot, there's a lot of, uh, you know, individual faith, uh, faith in our own abilities that we have. And, 
and I would say that's great, but companies are all about teams. Uh, you know, that's something really that people need to remember. It's not about individual effort. Uh, it's about team effort. So uh, becoming a leader is all about recognizing that it's now going to be about a team, not about you. Uh, so you may be, you know, whatever, a, a, a student, and even when you've done some jobs, you may be a star contributor there. But uh, when you really form, a, when you become a leader, uh, whether it's some company by someone else or uh, whether it's your own company, remember, it's all about the team. No matter what you can do, the team can do it better. So you have to think about team dynamics rather than individual dynamics. And so that's the uh, first um, advice I will give when you do a company. And so hiring a high caliber team around you and creating a great culture for the team to thrive become very important. Um, and you know, if you read this book, very famous book, Good to Great by Jim Collins, um, he speaks about the fact that um, you know, great companies are all about first putting the right people on the bus, and then those people will figure out what to do. And that's very true. Um, you can actually uh, hire, hire well, uh, build a great culture, and then that team will carry the company forward. And so I would really advise to think in that fashion, as opposed to I still, I know companies where we have IITs doing the companies, but it's a, it's a lot of solo effort. And the person thinks uh, they can carry the company to a unicorn. And, and sometimes they do, but I can assure you, uh, it won't scale well, much beyond that unless you change your mindset to a team mindset. Uh, so always think in terms of a team. Uh, think about the V, not the I. It was hard for me too. <laughs> you know, every one of us ITNs, I think, goes through that transition. You know, we were all raised, you know, people used to tell us that you're so smart, you're this, you're that. And suddenly it's no longer about the I, it's all about the V. Uh, that transition, the sooner you can make that transition, the easier it will be for you to become a great entrepreneur. So, so those are some of the things that I'd advise. Uh, you know, um, don't be in a hurry to start companies. When you do, think about a team. Surround yourself with great people, hire great people around you. And, and the, that automatically gives a great boost to the company. Uh, and beyond that, always, uh, I like to say, uh, don't do an incremental company. A lot of people uh, sit in like some other big company and they come up with a small idea that they might be working on. They're like, oh, let me do a company on this. Well, it might be a great uh, idea for that big company, a great project within the company, if you may, but it may not be a business by itself. Um, I think when you go out and do a company, it can be a small idea. It should not be. My preference is it's not a small idea. It, uh, you have to have a bigger vision behind it. Um, you may start the, your first product on a smaller idea. After all, you need to uh, get off the ground, but uh, the, the vision shouldn't be such that that's it. Because if that's it, then others are going to copy and soon you'll not be a company anymore. So you need to be able to continuously innovate into something bigger. Uh, and so you need to have something bigger to start with. So your vision ought to be, ought to be somewhat big. Don't just take the first problem you see out there and jump and uh, try to do a company on that. Uh, because what after that? There's nowhere to go. People will copy. Uh, I mean, look at Google. Google started off by, with, with search. But if they had only stopped at search, well, by now, Yahoo and Microsoft and whatnot would have killed Google. But Google kept innovating, right? Not only did it keep innovating on search, but they rolled out Gmail and YouTube and Google Maps and Google Apps and there's so many innovations they brought to us beyond that. And look at Apple, same thing. Started off with like the Mac OS and they had the iPod and iPhone and, and, and iPad and they keep uh, rolling out innovations. So always have this bigger vision a bigger mission behind what you do. So those, okay. those are some some pieces of advice I'd like to pass to That's budding cool. entrepreneurs thinking about doing companies. <laughs> wow, I'm, Mohit, I'm having so much fun talking to you. I can talk to you for hours, but um, you know, uh, so to, before we end our segment today, I have one question for you. Sure. If you can go back in time and go for a date, with anyone, who will that be and why? And I'm assuming 
I can go back any number of years, hundreds of years, thousands of absolutely. years, right? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, one name that comes to my mind um, is Einstein. And, and who would not want to have a date with Einstein, uh, a lunch with Einstein? But, but you'd be surprised, okay. my reasons might be a little bit different. Uh, it's not just because he was uh, such a great uh, you know, uh, scientist and, and did some wonderful things for the world. I would love to talk to him to understand and look at his passion. Did you know that he studied light for 17 years continuously? I mean, who would come up with phenomenal things about light if they like have just studied light for 17 years, right? They were besotted with it. And so that passion for one thing and just you know drilling down on that one thing is the reason why I would love to have a chat with Einstein. Uh, uh, and, and with so many other people who spent years and years, um, you know, refining uh, some one thing, you know, heck, Buddha got enlightenment because he thought about Nirvana for so long, right? Um, and, uh, and I think, but I think Einstein would be that person, uh, you know, uh, fascinating that he's uh, figured out all those things. I mean, who, who would think that time is not constant, that even time is relative, right? I mean, defies logic, so, but he figured it out when he thought about light the way he did. And he's like, well, that's the only logical explanation that time can be constant. And, and lo and behold, time is not constant. So that's fascinating, beautiful. fascinating. Yeah, that's beautiful. And uh, of course we uh, have deep appreciation for what he has done, but uh, uh, I'll summarize that in one line, what I understood. We are all in pursuit of perfection. We will never be perfect. It's a pursuit. And are we? It's a pursuit. The journey, the journey is sometimes more important than the destination. So uh, that's a big thing I talk to all the entrepreneurs and the companies I invest in is uh, just enjoy small moments. We will solve a lot of big problems, but let's continue to solve continue to enjoy, continue to find defining moments in our life. And there are so many of those. Uh, well, before I uh, conclude our uh, today's uh, impact series, do you have any suggestion, final words for our audience? Um, final words, I, uh, I would just say, um, you know, thank you so much for listening to us. Um, we have this great conference coming up. I did uh, you know, 2020. Um, uh, would love to see you guys participate. Uh, I love to connect with all the great personalities. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be uh, multiple of them that I'd like to love, uh, love to learn from. Uh, and I'd encourage uh, our audience to do the same. Cool. So Mohit, thank you very much for joining us today and supporting IIT community globally. What we have learned today, or I have learned today, there are a few areas you uh, believe uh, have phenomenal opportunities, data security, data privacy, data governance, and shipping computations. I'm sure uh, some of the audience may like to go and find and research about it. Second one I learn is don't be in a rush. Be patient with the universe. Third one I uh, learned from you today, especially me personally, it's about team efforts. Hire a great team, hire a passionate team. It's not about uh, really the finding the most intelligent guy, find the most passionate guy. If he's really passionate about your cause, is passionate about your idea, that's the kind of person you want in your team and work with him to build the next level of uh, organization or whatever you want to do. And the last one is- Actually, the, 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 best, the best kind of person is the person who can take your mission and make that mission, his or her own mission. That's the person you want. And the last one is keep innovating. For your- Always, always, always keep learning. You know, we have, I have this uh, phrase that we use in the company uh, at Cohesity, uh, be humble and keep learning. Stay Humility focused. opens yeah. you up for more learning, but life is about learning. <laughs> so uh, Mohit, I know we don't have time, but, uh, one thing I always find uh, all the speakers when I ask, what is one trait uh, 
they give almost 90, 95% of uh, credit to. And almost everyone said curiosity. What do you think about that? Um, I think curiosity would certainly be up there, but I would say the one trait I would give the most credit to is probably passion. People can be curious, but then not do anything about it. But if you have passion, you do all sorts of things. So passion is probably what I would, uh, passion and uh, because passion, if you have passion, you will be curious. You will have perseverance because you have the passion for it. You will have the grit. You will keep working on it. Um, and so passion is what I would put at the top. Very cool. And are you passionate about anything other than the data? <laughs> uh, I'm passionate about a number of things. I'm passionate about uh, my family, uh, spending time with them, you know, my dogs, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, a bunch of stuff. But, but yes, my work definitely is my passion. Awesome. Thank you, Mohit. I'm Sanjeev Goyal, conference chair of IID 2020, Pan IID USA's mega virtual event. Please join us on December 4th and 5th. Register iit2020.org. Our event is open to all. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks.